Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today about my favorite topic, the topic that I know more about possibly than everyone else, and that is imperfection. And in fact, um, when my mother found out that I was writing a book all about human flaws and imperfections, she told me, finally, something you know a lot about. And I put that as the dedication page of the book, which explains a lot about the relationship I have with my mother. But it's, it's wonderful to be here today to talk about imperfection and to hopefully uh, shed new light and a, and a new way of looking at imperfection as not the opposite of perfection. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. First of all, in biology, there's no such thing as perfection. Just the idea that any living thing could be perfect um, just simply doesn't make any sense. Because if you do a thought experiment and imagine a perfect organism that escaped every predator, defeated every disease, found all of its food, how long could it be like that before it ate all the food and the planet would be nothing but that thing uh, and then suddenly it would find itself not so perfect anymore? And um, I read an interesting thing in the, in the bulletin, in, in the program for this conference that talked about when a mistake is made, how do you know if that is the beginning of a new innovation or if it's just a goof up? How do you know if you're not really starting something brand new? And the reason why I love that so much and why it spoke to me is because that's exactly how this works in biology. Because every single bit of diversity in life Every single innovation, every single new thing about everything begins as a mutation. And many of you know what mutations are, but in case you don't, there are essentially errors in our DNA code, in our DNA uh, genetic material. And those errors can come about, about in a number of ways, but the most common way is a copying error, truly a mistake. But thank God for those mistakes because we wouldn't be anything more than anaerobic bacteria um, if it weren't for them. Everything good about us, all of our greatness, all of our innovation comes from these little tiny mistakes that then in the course of geologic time accumulate uh, into everything we see on this planet. And so, and there's a lesson there I think for our political times that we're living in right now. Diversity is good and it always has been. Um, it's the source of all of our greatness and all of our strength. Um, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, and in fact, it's just the beginning of this story, uh, at least the story of, of my book, Human Errors. Uh, we do actually have a body that has flaws in it, that has glitches. And in order to talk about those, I have to somewhat define what an error or a glitch is in this context. Um, because I don't want us to get tripped up into a semantic debate. Um, and what I define flaws or quirks or glitches or peccadillos, whatever word you want to use, how I define them is simply suboptimal function or suboptimal structure such that calls out for an explanation. So if it makes you scratch your head and say, who would design it that way, that basically fits my criteria. So that's the, in the inclusion criteria here is simply that which requires an explanation, that which a designer would never make. Now, I'm well aware that opinions can vary on that topic in the human body, and that it may be that we just simply don't know enough about some of these things. I'm painfully aware of that because this often explodes into very public debates. Um, and any of you who follow me on Twitter will find uh, when I have a couple of extra hours that I wish I could later take back, I get into these arguments with people about what is a flaw and what is a mistake. Um, but I'll stick with my very simple crude definition, that which requires an explanation. So in my book and, and in all of my writings, I, I found that the categories, uh, that there are three categories that the different flaws and quirks and errors that we have tend to fall into. Um, and the first of those categories is called mismatch. And the concept of mismatch is simply that we are now living in a world that is very different than the world that we evolved in. 
And we're using our bodies in very different ways than we used to, than we did for millions of years before that. So on that first mark, some people have a concern or, or an issue with what I define as flaws because it's just simply we're using our body uh, for a different purpose than it now was. Basically, another way to see it is cultural evolution has outpaced biological evolution. All right, and we now suffer a bit because of that. And just to let you all know, everybody in this room except me and a few back there are sitting in a very mismatched posture. Right? Chairs were not part of our evolutionary past. We find them very comfortable. We sit in them all day, and you pay a price for doing that because your body was not meant to sit in a chair. More about that another day. Um, but uh, another example of a mismatch, in case you're curious, I I'm sitting out here and I'm seeing a lot of corrective lenses, right? a lot of eyeglasses. Um, and that's a, probably an understatement because some of you are wearing contact lenses, and others of you, like me, have had lasers shot in your eye and had your eyes fixed. But the point is, is that myopia is a, it, the inability to see at distance is a scourge on humanity. About 40% of the population of Europe and North America um, require corrective lenses to see at distance, and that number goes up to about 75% in Asia. So in other words, most of the planet has poor vision. Most of the individuals have poor vision. That's some bad design right there. And imagine, if you will, an eagle or a hawk that can't see very well at distance. How long do you think that eagle would survive? Not very long. The eagle would starve and take his bad eyes with him. Um, so how are we allowed to have this very poor vision? Well, there's two answers to this, one biological and one cultural. The biological one is simply that we don't need to have perfect vision in order to survive. And that's a good thing. Right? It's a good thing we're not eagles because what it says about us culturally is that there's many different ways that an individual can contribute and be successful. Maybe you're not the best hunter. You could be a homesteader. You could be a gatherer. You could be a shaman. All right? In fact, some of the most important people in our cultural group are those that share their wisdom, generally the, the elderly. The, the oldest uh, members of our population are a reservoir of wisdom. And the fact that our eyes don't have to be perfect, in my view, is the happy story. Aren't you glad your body doesn't have to be perfect in order to be alive and thrive and contribute to society? Um, and that's just not true for a lot of animals, so it's a good thing. Why is this a mismatch flaw, though? That seems like the eyes just built wrong if we're, so many of us uh, can't see well. Well, what we found in the last 10 years is that the rate of myopia is almost directly correlated with how much time you spent indoors as a child. So the more time you spent indoors, the greater the odds are that you need corrective lenses as you get older, as you, as you uh, enter adolescence. Because that's when this typically hits, is in childhood. Because our eyes are still growing and we spend, we're in school, we're in daycare, we spend all our time looking at short distances and as our eyes are growing, they don't grow to the correct length. And so, if you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, for example, their myopia rate is down below 10% because they're outside all of the time. So as we began to live indoors, our eyes didn't start working so well. So that's why, that's that category of flaws, mismatch. Some of the back problems that you are all gonna go home suffering today are the result of mismatch, partially because of how you're sitting right now. Um, sorry to hit you over the head with that yet again. So that's one category of flaws. But one thing that I find interesting is for each one of our flaws, we have a creative solution. Um, and I use the word creative on purpose because if you look around the room and look at all of these corrective lenses, what have, the, the glasses that you can see, what have we done with that? We've made art out of it. We've made fashion. Eyeglasses are a, a fashion accessory. Many people now, especially if you live in Brooklyn, wear glasses even if they don't need them, right? Just as a fashion statement, just as iconography in one way or another. So here's a case of a flaw. We never would have invented glasses if our vision, if we had hawk eyes, right? But we have invented glasses, and since we have to have them, let's make them beautiful. So that's, that's part of the human story as well. Another category of uh, flaws are what we call trade-offs or compromises. And this really highlights the limits of evolution, the limits of our anatomy, and the fact that we really... All we have is the body we have at this time, and mutation can simply make tweaks and tugs and little, uh, tiny little changes 
Uh, and that's the best you can do from one generation to the next. Of course, over time, you can get radical change, but the changes are small. Look at your ankle, for example, or your wrist, right? You have about seven bones sloshing around in your wrist. There's no way an engineer would design a robot that looks anything with, with a joint that looks anything like our wrist or our ankle. But we're stuck with a certain anatomical chassis that all vertebrates have, that all mammals have, that we can only just tweak. And we end up with extra bones and, and uh, bizarre uh, paths for our nerves and uh, all kinds of weird things that have no explanation based on design. They simply are the result of evolution's meandering path. And these little tweaks and tugs are the, are the best that evolution can do. Um, and I have lots of uh, fun examples of that uh, that I could share with you. And then there's some errors and imperfections in our body that are just nothing more than bad luck. Um, for example, we have a gene, well, what's left of a gene, called GULO, uh, which is a, a key enzyme. It codes for a key enzyme in vitamin C synthesis. Now, you might be asking, vitamin C synthesis? We can make our own vitamin C? The answer is no, we can't, because the gene's been mutated by pure chance and, 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 and beyond recognition, beyond function. So you have to have vitamin C in your diet simply for that reason. You can almost make it yourself in your liver cells. You can almost get there, but you have that one gene that's been inactivated. That's unusual in the animal kingdom. Outside of primates, pretty much every other animal makes vitamin C for themselves in their own bodies. It's not a nutrient they need to get from their diet. Any of you have dogs and cats, are you worried about them getting enough citrus fruit? Right? There's zero fruit in their diet, typically, or at least not necessary, because they simply make this stuff for themselves. In fact, humans have an incredibly needy diet, um, as I talk about, because we are so used to having nutrients just served up to us uh, nice and easy, so we don't make them for ourselves anymore. So those are the three categories of errors, and each one of them have, has lots of interesting um, examples and, 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 and things that we can learn from them. And um, in, in my book, I, I categorize them not just by, by their functional categories, but also where and how they occur. And the anatomy is, in many ways, uh, uh, the richest chapter of examples, because everyone can sort of poke and prod on their own bodies and find these little flaws uh, and little glitches. And I already talked about your eyes. Um, but there's even, even more than that. Has anybody here, I don't know if the, there's not enough people to have any hands up, but has anybody here ever had a cold? Anyone? Not even one of you never had a cold? I imagine a few of you have had a cold before. Um, many of you have also probably suffered sinus infections. Anybody here have sinus infections? Well, again, those of you with companion animals, three or four times a year do you find your dog and cat sniffling, sneezing, coughing, having any of those symptoms? No, what people don't realize is the common cold is, is pretty much a uniquely human problem. And the reason why is we have these huge uh, ca uh, cavities, they're actually small compared to other mammals, but uh, for our anatomy, huge cavities behind our cheekbones called the sinus cavities, the maxillary sinus cavities. And they are supposed to flow with mucus and grab stuff and uh, keep everything nice and clean in terms of the air that you breathe. Well, if you have this nice flowing mucus that's supposed to grab stuff, where would you put the drain that this mucus is supposed to drain down into? If you had any sense whatsoever as a plumber, where would you put the drain? At the bottom. That is not at all what we do. The drain pipe for your largest sinus cavities is located at the top of the chamber, which means you have to work against gravity very hard to get mucus to flow upwards uh, in, in order to keep things healthy. It, that means it does not take much to gum it all up and get it stuck and have a festering pool of mucus, uh, and that's how you get sinus infections in the common cold. Um, that's why sometimes, especially if you have a sinus infection, laying down gives you temporary relief. This weird design is not found in any other mammals. Even our closest relatives, the other apes, have dealt with the problem. And, and by the way, the problem I'm talking about is the reduction of the snout that happened in our ancestry. We reduced our snout, brought our eyes forward, rearranged our face. So we had to do something with these sinus cavities. All of the other apes did a better job rearranging their face than we did. We really got the worst end of this deal. Another funny anatomical quirk that uh, most people find interesting. There's a nerve that leaves your brain and goes to your larynx. Okay, it's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now you might expect it makes a nice easy route out of your brain into your throat, out of the back of your spinal cord, right there into your larynx. But if you thought that, you would be wrong. 
It turns out this nerve dives deep into your chest, wraps around some blood vessels, and then comes back up into your neck where it finds the larynx. And you'll see on this slide here, there's two nerves that I point out that go to the larynx. One does make the nice, easy, direct route, and the other nerve actually wraps around your aorta. Any chest surgeons are very conscious of this nerve because if they are not careful while performing open heart surgery, you could lose your ability to speak uh, ever again if that nerve gets cut. Funny design, right? That's because it wasn't design. Evolution doesn't work by designs. What happened was, deep in our ancestry, that nerve went from the brain to the gills. So I'm talking about the way back in our, when our ancestors were fish. And that was a straight shot from the, from the brain through what would become the heart to the gills, nice and easy. But then, of course, we developed a neck and a chest and all these things spread out, and that nerve just got tangled up with the aorta, and here it is today. And if you think it's bad for us, think about giraffes or the brontosaurus. How many meters was that stupid nerve going down into their chest only to come right back up again? So those are some anatomical flaws. We also have flaws in our genome. I already talked about one of them, but it turns out you have as many broken genes as functional genes in your DNA. I don't know if you knew that. They're called pseudogenes. The gulo is, is one pseudogene. You have many others. Um, in addition, you have tons of repetitive, non-functional DNA uh, that for all intents and purposes does nothing, but potentially causes great harm if it's still jumping around your genome. Um, uh, the numbers vary, and there's certainly debates going on about this, but I can confidently say at least half of your DNA has no positive function. It does nothing. It potentially causes harm. Um, in addition to the pseudogenes and the repetitive stuff, about 9% of your DNA isn't even yours in a sense. It's viral DNA. It's the carcasses of viral infection, left over from viral infections that our ancestors won, but the remains are kept in our chromosomes, and we dutifully copy them and spread them to every cell in our body every single generation. Uh, so our genome is, is uh, just a mess. Again, nothing showing, showing no signs of design. No, no sane engineer would design our genome that way. I already talked a little bit about our diet. We need vitamin C in our diet, but that's just the beginning. Think about the the food groups or the food pyramid and all the different food advice you're getting now. It's all bewildering and conflicting. Today they're saying we need that. Tomorrow they're going to say, no, no, we were wrong, cut that out. The point is, is that there's some truth to all this. We do need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, not too much this. Make sure you get enough of that. Um, and that's really a uniquely human problem. Look at your pets once again. Premium dog food is lamb and rice. And that's all they eat every day, all day, and they will be perfectly healthy. The koala bear eats eucalyptus leaves every day, all day. And while they might supplement, they don't need to. They can be happy on eucalyptus leaves, right? And eucalyptus leaves are not very nutritious by our standards, and yet they do just fine. So why do we struggle so much with our, our diet? It's because during our deep past, we were evolving in the salad bowl of, of, of sub-Saharan Africa, where lots of nutrients were just simply served up to us right in our diet, so our body got lazy. And that's another important lesson of evolution, that the way that we keep tip-top shape is through the harshness of natural selection. And when you remove the harshness of natural selection, our body gets lazy, and we stop doing these things for ourselves. Um, reproduction, this is another one. We, we have tons of flaws throughout the reproductive process, um, and anybody who suffered with infertility um, has probably contended with this this bizarre thing, if, if our species should be able to do anything, it should be reproduction, right? Um, but we, we, we suffer there uh, for various reasons as well. And the one that I often like to point out, because it's a good evolutionary compromise, is childbirth. Childbirth is, una unassisted, unaided childbirth is an incredibly painful and dangerous procedure. In fact, it was probably one of the leading causes of death of both women and infants for a long part of our history. That is also unusual. You don't see that in other apes. In fact, birth, for the most part, in, among mammals, isn't, that, isn't even that dramatic of an affair. I've seen videos of gorillas continuing to care for other children and eat while giving birth. Anybody ever seen like a cow give birth? The cow just sort of plops off and walks away, and the other cow's just going about its business. It, this is really a human thing to have such a struggle with childbirth. And if you want to know why, 
it's because of our big old brains, right? Um, if you look at the chimpanzee pelvis and the chimpanzee skull at birth, you'll notice a nice easy fit. The chimpanzee doesn't struggle during the process of parturition uh, of giving birth. If you look at our ancestor from about two and a half million years ago, Lucy, you'll see that fit tightened up quite a bit. Lucy was standing upright and the, the skull of the infant uh, of the Australopithecus afarensis fits through, fits through the pelvic girdle, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not too comfortable. But now if we look at a human pelvis, a female pelvis um, at adulthood and the skull at birth, I see, I see lots of uh, uncomfortable people when they see this. Um, if you're thinking that doesn't fit, then you're, you're on the right track. Uh, basically, what we have here is a trade-off of, of evolution pulling on both ends of the rope. Of the rope excuse me. One, our big brains. One, um, uh, our pelvises that got skinnier so that we could walk upright and have this nice striding gait where we're not bouncing our weight around. And compromises, trade-offs, that's the story of evolution. Now, how do, we, how do we deal with this particular compromise? Well, one thing we do is we're born way, way, way too early. So before the brain got any bigger, we push them out. Uh, and our, we're just not ready. Most, most mammals um, are born and then walk around and start going off the, on their own. A horse kind of shakes itself off and is off and running. Whereas humans are completely dependent on their parents for about 30 years. Okay, uh, and because I'm getting called on time, I can't give you uh, any more examples, but um, we also have a lot of diseases where our immune system attacks itself and all kinds of funny things that we have a, a, worse, a worse problem than a lot of other animals, um, and uh, sickle cell anemia and, uh, as a defense against malaria. Many of part probably know that story already, but we actually evolved this disease as a way to combat malaria, uh, and it works pretty well when it doesn't kill you of sickle cell anemia. Um, and so this is the story. And, and the last category of flaws, the way, what I'll end my, my presentation on, is the flaws in our mind. And I usually don't have to say too much about that in this particular political moment, because it's pretty clear that we're losing our minds <laughs> and giving up on everything that made our civilization great in the first place. But the point is, is that we do have flaws and errors in our brains, and our mind, that psychologists call cognitive biases, that are not just limits. They're not just, they're not just us not being good enough. We make the same kinds of mistakes over and over and over, even when we should know better. There really is some faulty wiring uh, in our brain. And so what I want to end, end this with is, is, why did I write this book all about our flaws? It sounds like such a depressing topic. It, it's not really, because... It tells us so much about our past. Our flaws are beautiful. They're also illuminating. One way to find our, out about our, fast, uh, about our past is to dig up fossils and study them. But we also have the marks right in our own body of our past. And all of these flaws are like scars from the great battles of survival. The battles that we won against a lot of odds. And now, given those flaws in our minds, we have a big question to ask is, is are our big brains going to be the, the, the best thing we ever did, the pinnacle of creation, or is it going to be our biggest flaw? As of right now, in the next 50 or 60 years, I could see it going either way. Thank you so much uh, for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of the festival.